At this point, I'm going to take a few steps back and describe to you what a fractal is, because the Mandelbrot set is a fractal. And in order to fully understand what the Mandelbrot set is, we must first understand what a fractal is. Fractals are generated by iterating a function or by applying a feedback loop to a system. Iterating a function means that you take the output from the equation and feed it back into the equation. A fractal, then, is what emerges from these feedback systems. We call this the emergent property of the system. Usually, fractals are displayed as pictures where the numbers coming out of the fractal equation are mapped to colors and positions on a graphics display. However, fractals can also be represented as sounds or as three-dimensional models. It's up to the fractal practitioner to decide how to present their data. In fractal theory, self-similarity and scalability go hand in hand. When you look closely at this shape, you can clearly see that the smaller shapes, or branches, are just scaled replicas of the whole object, and that this same pattern is repeated over and over again at all scales. This is nice for the plant because it only has to remember how to make one shape and a few simple rules, and voila, a broccoli head. What are these simple rules, you ask? When you look at the spiraling branches near the top of this plant, you can see that they're very similar to the ones near the bottom, only they're scaled smaller, so scaling must be one of the rules. Also, you'll notice that they're orientated differently, so rotation must be a rule. Then you'll notice that they appear in different locations within the plant, so translation must also be one of the rules. These are the main rules or transformations that are used to make most, if not all, fractals. Scaling, rotation, and translation. No calculus required. It's at this point that most people ask, so a fractal is a hologram, right? Well, not exactly. A hologram is a fractal, but not the other way around. A fractal is not necessarily a hologram. When you record a hologram, the original object being recorded is encoded at all scales onto the photographic plate. This is why when you break a hologram in half, the beam can still reconstruct the whole image because the whole image is encoded at all scales onto the photographic plate. In other words, the interference pattern recorded onto the photographic plate is a self-similar or self-same fractal pattern. Another property of fractals is something called a fractal dimension, where the dimension of the object is not a whole number like one, two, or three dimensions, but somewhere in between. In other words, the dimension of a fractal is a fractional number. That's why they're called fractals, because the dimension that they exist in is a fraction. For example, you can have a fractal dimension of 2.5, or 1.777, or pi, for instance. The fractal in this image is also generated using a small set of simple rules that include scaling and translation, but no rotation. It has the properties of self-similarity, or self-sameness in this case, and scaling, and its fractal dimension is measured to be the irrational number 1.58496, etc. It's curious that this simple fractal has an irrational number as its fractal dimension. In fact, I believe that all real fractals that exist must have irrational fractal dimensions, and I'll get into why I think this a little later. If our universe is a fractal, then I wonder what its fractal dimension is. Since pi is an irrational number, I would hazard a guess that our three-plus dimensional universe has a fractal dimension of pi. 3.1419265, etc.
Now that we know what a fractal is, we can begin to talk about the most famous and awesome fractal of all. The Mandelbrot set as a mathematical construct was first investigated by a pair of French mathematicians named Pierre Fatou and Gaston Julia near the beginning of the 20th century. Pierre Fatou worked in the field of complex analytic dynamics and was actually the first to define the Mandelbrot set and speculate about its properties. Gaston Julia devised the formula for something called the Julia set, which is closely related to the Mandelbrot set, as I'll be showing you shortly. In 1979, Benoit Mandelbrot began to study the Mandelbrot and Julia sets, building on the previous work of both Fatou and Julia. With access to the best computers at that time in 1979, he began to plot the very first images of the Julia and Mandelbrot sets and was the first to glimpse the infinite beauty and complexity of these mathematical anomalies. In 1982, he expanded on his ideas in his influential work, The Fractal Geometry of Nature, bringing fractals into the mainstream of mathematics, computer science, and popular culture. The Mandelbrot set is generated by iterating a very simple equation. Z equals Z squared plus C, where Z and C are complex numbers. Well, that seems simple enough, but what the heck is a complex number? A complex number is not so much a number as it is a point. It's a point that lives on the 2D complex plane, as opposed to a real number, which lives on the one-dimensional real number line. There are two components to the complex plane. A real component represented by the real numbers, and we all know what a real number is, right? and an imaginary component represented by the imaginary numbers, and I'm pretty sure that many of you don't know what an imaginary number is, so I'll explain this as best as I can. Imaginary numbers were defined by Raphael Bombelli in 1572. At the time, such numbers were regarded as fictitious or even useless, much as zero was once regarded as nonsense in the past. Imaginary numbers arise when you try to take the square root of a negative number. This, of course, leads to all sorts of problems, since you can't take the square root of a negative real number and end up with a real number. In other words, there's no such real number that will satisfy this problem. What Bombelli did was he defined a new kind of number by taking the square root of negative 1 and calling it i for imaginary. This I became the multiplicative identity for the imaginary numbers, much in the same way that one is identity for the integer and real numbers. In other words, any real number multiplied by the square root of negative 1, or I, is called an imaginary number. Interestingly, imaginary numbers seem to pop up all over the place and can be found littered throughout the equations used in electrical engineering, quantum mechanics, and Einstein's theory of relativity. With that in mind, it becomes clear that imaginary numbers are an integral part of our physical universe and therefore must play a big role in the creation and persistence of our universe. <laughs> so a complex number is an imaginary number together with a real number. Put simply, the Mandelbrot set image is generated by iterating points from the complex plane, the set of all complex numbers, through the function z equals z squared plus c. Each time a point is put into the equation, another point comes out. This iteration process produces a sequence of points that either escape to infinity, as happens with the points on the outside of the Mandelbrot set, or they get trapped in a black region, in which case they're said to be inside the Mandelbrot.